So we are currently in, in this series uh, that we call Relatable. All right. So I am assuming that a lot of us, if not all of us, have been constantly attending our Koinonia sessions. We've been going through this series. And believe it or not, we are exactly on the halfway point. Imagine halfway point na tayo. So we're in the middle of this Relatable series. And ju just to share with you, I am one of the leaders of our single adults ministry. So we're leading the SALT ministry. Uh, so some of you are here. And I, I can just testify and be honest with you that I can really see it happening. I can see that making relationships work, it's happening. <laughs> it's really happening. And, and what's more amazing because of the pandemic, we're forced somehow to do it on Zoom. But because we're on Zoom, we're not just helping out single adults here in Singapore. We're also able to reach out to the Philippines. We're also able to, to reach out to other countries as well. We have an attendee who's from Vietnam. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing, really. And we can see that this series is blessing a lot of us. And if you are not aware, if, if you're clueless, what's this relatable, then I highly encourage you to join a koinonia. You can ask me, you can ask any of our pastors, any of the people around here. A lot of us are familiar with this. Please join a koinonia. Nothing, it, it's really the best thing. Every Friday, we look forward to attending the koinonia. And it, it's just so wonderful to be part of a loving community. And a lot of you are nodding your heads because you know what I mean. If you're not nodding your head, then maybe you're missing out. So please do attend. Find a koinonia that you can attend. Geography is not an issue anymore because most of us are doing it on, on Zoom. So please let me know. Let our pastors know. Anyone here, if you, have, if you want to join a koinonia. And that goes for you too. Those who are on, online. So I'm speaking to you right now. If you are listening to this sermon right now and you don't have a koinonia yet, Please join one. Maybe you can leave a comment there somewhere and someone will definitely respond to you. So please join a koinonia if in case you're not yet part of one. So to begin this message, I want us to think. If we were in a classroom, I would rather have you talk, but since we can't do that, I just want you to think. So let's, let's have a warm-up exercise. Think about a recent good news that you have heard. It might be something personal to you, might be career, might be in your family life, might be your health. So think about that right now. So I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to think about the events that are happening in your life that you can consider good news. You know, it, it's a nice feeling to think about a good news that happens in your life. So since I cannot ask you to share to your neighbors, then I will share mine. So several months ago, I, I, I went through a an annual physical exam. And I, I'm used to it, I do it every year, and I'm normally okay. And that test went pretty okay, as, as expected. However, when I got the results, things changed. My doctor told me that my cholesterol were really, uh, to, to say the least, it was bad. It, it was pretty bad. My bad cholesterol, the numbers were so high, the good cholesterol, the numbers were so low. So put those two things together, that is a very, uh, <laughs> it causes me some anxiety and panic. There's something wrong with me. So I had to really pay close attention to what my doctor was telling me. So he said, you have to change your diet, you have to exercise some more, and you have to you know, lessen the stress in your life. Okay, <laughs> okay, so that was uh, maybe three, four months ago. So I had to do that for a few months and then have my blood tested again to see if things change. Several months, I did my best, uh, changed my diet, salmon became my favorite food, uh, lessened the pork, lessened the, the red meat and so on, exercised more frequently. So a lot of changes in my life, tried my best to de-stress more, and then the day came. I had to go back to the doctor, have my blood tested, and see if there are any changes. So this happened maybe two, three weeks ago. I went to the doctor. My BP is going up high because I'm so scared to know the news. I don't know what the doctor will tell me. And then he told me, you know, Elmer, it's okay. It's good. You see your numbers here, your bad cholesterol, it went down. 
way down to the point that it's not just healthy, it's great. It's not just normal, it's amazing. So the bad cholesterol, whew, amen, amen. Then he said, the good cholesterol, it went a little higher, but you can do better. You can do better. But for me, when I heard that the, good, the bad cholesterol went down, it was just, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I don't have to do maintenance anything, or I don't have to, to do any other intervention. And it, it's just so good news. And after that, we celebrated by eating sisig and crispy pata. No, no, no. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. We didn't, I, it was in my head, but I just heard some good news, but I will not spoil the good news. <laughs> some of you are agreeing with me. Some of you might have tried those tests before. It's so nerve-wracking. It's so nerve-wracking. You don't know what the doctor will say. So when, I, 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 when I'm sharing about the good news, I also want you to think about another type of good news. And if you've been a Christian for quite some time now, you've probably, you're thinking that good news is equal this. Good news is actually equal to the gospel. Gospel literally means good news, good news. And, it, and the word gospel is, is used so often that sometimes the meaning is diluted. Sometimes the meaning gets lost somewhere. So I want you to think about this question. Why is the gospel news and why is it good? If the translation says that the gospel equals good news, why is it news in the first place? And why do we call it good? Think about that. Why is it news and why is it good? It will take a while for that to sink in. I want, you to, I want to share with you um, a good reference that I've read recently. So if you want a comprehensive answer to this question, I highly recommend this book. It's written by Dr. N.T. Wright or Dr. Tom Wright. The title is Simply Good News. He goes many, many chapters digging deep on why the gospel is such good news. But since we don't have a lot of time to discuss his book, I'll just summarize it for you. He says that there are three major components for something to be considered news. There has to be something that happened. It's a real event. It's not just hearsay. It's not just someone said something. It has to be a real event. And because of that real event, something is happening as an effect. And because something is happening, something in the future will happen. The events that we consider news, it affects what's happening right now and will change what's happen, what will happen in the future. For example, in my cholesterol journey, something happened. The good news was, the doctor told me, I improved. I was all good in terms of my cholesterol. Because of that, what's happening right now, I've developed this brand new habit of picking fish over red meat, exercising more daily, taking time to, to, to de-stress and not worry too much so that I can control my cholesterol. And I know because of this, something will happen in the future. I will have more years to spend with my kids and my family. I don't have to worry about going back to the doctor with that same anxiety as long as I keep my discipline. I keep my diet and exercise in check. So that's what we call news. Something happened, because of that, something's happening, and then something in the future is affected by it. Let's put it in the Christian context. When we say good news, what is it about? It's Jesus. Jesus himself is claiming that he is the news. He is the good news in person. Something happened. God himself decided that I, will, I want to save my people. I love my people so much that I have to go down myself, God in flesh, in Jesus, and I'll be the one to save them. Something happened. Because of that, something's happening. Our lives are changed. We have new hope in him. And you know what? There's something incredibly amazing that will happen in the future. He will come back again. And when that time comes, we'll all be together back in perfect relationship with God the way he intended it to be. And that's why the gospel is good news. So why are we talking about the good news right now? I want to focus on the middle part. Something happened and something will happen, 
but something is supposed to be happening right now while we are waiting for that future time. What is that something happening right now? If we are truly followers of Jesus and we understand the good news, what would be happening right now? That's something to ponder upon. What would be happening right now if we truly understand the good news? A quick answer there would be transformed lives. Lives would be different. Inside this church, let's take this as a sample. Inside this church, we will have people full of love. People who are understanding one another. People who are patient with one another. But to tell you the truth, and it's not just in this place, it's all over the world, that's not really what's happening. There are people, Christians themselves, who are fighting, who, are, um, who have issues with one another. And it's, it's frustrating because of all people, right? Of all people, we are the ones that are not able to show love to one another. And perhaps there's a solution for it. And the solution for that is what we're going to talk about today. The key message or the main idea that we will take home today is this. Jesus followers love genuinely. Love genuinely. We were talking about a while ago, what should be happening right now because of what Jesus did on the cross? We should be people who love one another. We have to be loving one another, but there are, we have room for improvement. I, I hope you see that, that even... I, myself, I have room for improvement in terms of loving one another. And when we see that room for improvement, maybe this is the solution. Jesus' followers love genuinely. What does that mean when you say love genuinely? And what does it mean when you say Jesus' followers? So if you look at the message, the main idea today, it's coming from the book or the letter to the Romans. It has two parts. Jesus' followers, what does that mean? And second, what does love genuinely mean? So if I would give a title for this message, it's called Genuine Love. Very simple, genuine love. What does that actually mean when you say genuine love? When you say genuine love, is there such a thing as fake love? Is there such a thing as imitation kind of love? We'll find out based on what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. Let's give a bit of a context here. The letter to the Church of Rome was written by Paul primarily, so here's the purpose of the letter. Primarily, it's for unity. Paul wanted the Jews and the Gentiles to be united in the church in Rome. So just a bit of um, vocabulary here. But when we say Jews and Gentiles, sino ba mga to? who are these Jews and Gentiles? Jews are pretty much your Israelites. These are the ones who have descendants all the way back to Moses, Abraham, and so on. So these are the Jews. Gentiles are pretty much non-Jews. So they're like opposites. During this time, when Jesus already gave the Great Commission, during this time, the churches were already mixed. There were Israelites and there were also Gentiles. Paul was the one trying to reach out to more and more Gentiles, but there's a problem. There is a tension between Jews and Gentiles, and therefore there was disunity. They were, they were not having a good relationship with one another. What was the cause of the tension? The, the cause was really their culture. It was a culture clash. And even today at present, there's a lot of issues between different cultures. So the Jew and Gentile tension was caused by clashing customs and practices. Here's an example. For the Israelites, they believed that to be part of God's family, you have to be circumcised. It's part of their culture. And Jews believed that. But Gentiles, if you could imagine, Gentiles weren't Israelites. They didn't follow that custom. So they didn't agree. They believed that. I already know Jesus. I already follow him. Why would I follow your customs? Why would I follow your practices? Another thing, for the Israelites, we have, they have this what they call kosher or food laws. You cannot eat this, you cannot eat that, and so on and so forth. And therefore, that's part of the law. That's part of what they're supposed to do. The Gentiles, on the other hand, we don't have that culture. 
I want to eat pork. I want to eat pig. The Israelites, they don't eat pork. The Gentiles were disagreeing. That's not part of our culture. Why are you forcing us to do that? Why are you forcing us to also follow that? So it caused a tension between those two races, the Jews versus the Gentiles. So Paul heard about this, and Paul wanted to provide a solution, being the leader. You know what? Paul also had another objective. He wanted this church to be united, the church in Rome, because he believed that if this church in Rome becomes really united, really strong, he can use it as a base, like a home base. This is where I can plant myself so that I have better access to other places around it. He was targeting Spain. He wanted to preach. He wanted to go and continue his missionary journey to Spain. So he believed that if this church in Rome becomes strong, I can use that as my base so I have easier access to Spain. So he had that other objective. But anyway, he wanted unity in the church. If I was Paul, I am thinking, hmm, what would be a good solution for this? They have clashing cultures. Then maybe step one, respect each other's cultures. Step two, maybe you can write it down on the wall so that they, cannot, they will not forget it. Step three, maybe appoint a police or something. If I was thinking that way, maybe that would have been the solution if I'm Paul, but I'm not Paul. He knew better. You know what his solution was? It wasn't to put up additional laws. Paul's solution was a comprehensive review of the gospel. He went back to the basics. These Jews and Gentiles, even if they had different cultures, both parties or both groups were already followers of Jesus. They already knew Jesus. So they were already Christians, as we call them now. So Paul said, maybe you're forgetting what unifies us. Maybe you're forgetting our common, uh, our common practice, not the kosher or the circumcision laws, but it's Jesus. And maybe if you bring it to today's context, whatever fights, whatever tension, whatever issues we might have, maybe this is the solution as well. A comprehensive review of the gospel. So let's have one. <laughs> let's have one. Because I'm pretty sure we encounter tensions every now and then, even with our fellow Christians. Let's have a comprehensive review of the gospel. Don't worry, it's not that long because there's a video that I will show you that actually somehow summarizes what Paul said in his letter to the Romans. And this video is called The Romans' Road to Salvation. Some of you are nodding your heads. You might have heard of it before. So if you're not familiar with it, then good news for you. You will learn something new. In this video, The Romans' Road to Salvation, Apparently, if you read chapters 1 all the way to chapter 11 of Romans, Paul gives a very comprehensive, perhaps the most comprehensive review of the gospel there. So if you want to know what is this gospel, check out his letter, chapters 1 to 11. That's pretty long, so we'll just watch a video. The video will show us that in the book of Romans, there are verses there that you can actually use as a guide to just remember what the gospel or what salvation actually means. So let's try to watch the video and learn from it. What is the Romans Road to Salvation? The Romans Road to Salvation is a way of explaining the good news of salvation using verses from the book of Romans. It is a simple yet powerful method of explaining why we need salvation, how God provided salvation, how we can receive salvation, and what are the results of salvation? The first verse on the Romans' road to salvation is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. We have all done things that are displeasing to God. There is no one who is innocent. Romans 3.10-18 gives a detailed picture of what sin looks like in our lives. The second scripture on the Romans' road to salvation, Romans 6.23, teaches us about the consequences of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The punishment that we have earned for our sins is death, not just physical death, but eternal death. The third stop on the Romans' road to salvation 
picks up where Romans 6.23 left off. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus' death paid for the price of our sins. Jesus' resurrection proves that God accepted Jesus' death as the payment for our sins. The fourth stop on the Romans' road to salvation is Romans 10.9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because of Jesus' death on our behalf, all we have to do is believe in him, trusting his death as the payment for our sins, and we will be saved. Romans 10.13 says it again, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and rescue us from eternal death. Salvation, the forgiveness of sins, is available to anyone who will trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The final aspect of the Romans' road to salvation is the results of salvation. Romans 5.1 has this wonderful message. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we can now have a relationship of peace with God. Romans 8.1 teaches us, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus' death on our behalf, we will never be condemned for our sins. Finally, we have this precious promise of God from Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you like to follow the Romans road to salvation? If so, here is a simple prayer that you can pray to God. Saying this prayer is a way to declare to God that you are relying on Jesus Christ for your salvation. The words themselves will not save you. Only faith in Jesus Christ will provide salvation. God, I know that I have sinned against you and am deserving of punishment. But Jesus Christ took the punishment that I deserve, so through that faith in him I could be forgiven. With your help, I place my trust in you for salvation. Thank you for your wonderful grace and forgiveness, the gift of eternal life. Amen. Amazing. Amazing, right? In just the letter of Paul to the church of Rome, in Rome, he gives such a wonderful review of what the gospel is. And remember the context of this letter. He gave that review, not just for remembering it, but, just, but for uniting the Jews and the Gentiles and any other clashes or issues or difficulties they might have, this is the solution. We have to know what the gospel is because that unites us. So from chapters 1 to 11 of the book of Romans or the letter to the church in Rome, he says that that's the gospel and we need Jesus. Now we jump to, verse, or to chapter 12. In chapter 12, he starts off with therefore. That's why we had to do a quick review of the first part of the book of Romans. Bible reading tip, brothers and sisters, when you read the Bible and when you see that word therefore, go back to what happened before. Because something really important happened first and then now this is the result. Now this is the result. Okay, now that we know that the gospel was first reviewed in the first major part of Romans, Here's our response. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of what I just elaborated on for 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Think about that. Bodies as living sacrifice. In their context, when you mention the word sacrifice, they would think of sheep. They would think of animals being offered. They're dead. They're being offered. And the purpose was to please God. That you're offering it to God so that I can please you, so that you can accept me. But now it's different. Because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to do that anymore. Your bodies, our bodies, would be the sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So now Paul becomes really practical. You know the gospel, you know the good news, this is what we're supposed to do. Our bodies, our physical bodies, that will be our living sacrifice to please God. Our actions, not just our feelings, not just our thinking, it's our actions that we do with our body. 
in the next verses after this, he will go on and talk more about transforming your lives, using your gifts, and so on. But I want us to jump to verse 9. Because this is our main topic today. If you remember, our main idea or our key message today is that Jesus followers love genuinely. Jesus followers, I hope you somehow understand that now. Check. Jesus followers, that's the gospel. That's what we know. But loving genuinely, what does that mean according to Paul? And Paul says in verse 9, love must be sincere or genuine. What does that look like? Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. It's two parts, basically. You hate what is evil, so if there's something wrong happening, you, you have to do something about it, and you cling to what is good. Honestly, for me, I have an easier time clinging to what is good, because it's good, it's nice, it's pleasing. I can cling to that, I can hold on to that, but when I see that sir, there's something wrong happening, do I hate that? Do I do an action to counter that? Or do I just ignore it? Eh, yeah, muna. It's happening already. It's part of our culture anyway. Let, let it happen. Or do we as Christians take a stand and say, no, that's something that we have to correct. That's something that we have to fix. What else does Paul say? Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. When you say be devoted, devoted is, it, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a constant thing. You do not stop. You're devoted it to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. I hope you're thinking right now, who is this person who honored one another above their, 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 uh, their own self? That's Jesus. Paul is now teaching practical things that he learned from Jesus. Never be lacking in zeal. Zeal is your passion. Zeal is your, you're, you're able to give your 100%. You're able to give your all. Don't be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. It's like a fire inside you, serving the Lord. So when you are loving one another, when we are serving other people, when we are helping other people, it has to be devoted. It has to be consistent, even when it's tough. Paul adds some more. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You see, Paul is now be, be being so practical here. And this is his usual pattern. If you've read his other letters, he usually starts off with a review of the gospel. And because of the gospel, here are the things that we have to do to address your issues, to address the problems. He has gone through so many commands here, so many imperatives. Even if we can just apply a few of them, things will change. Things will change. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. If you join a koinonia, you're already doing this. When you share with the Lord's people who are in need, when you offer your listening ear to them, as they share their concerns, you're already doing that. When you open up your home to have the koinonia happen there, that's already practicing hospitality. A lot of us here, when we gather every, coin, every time we have a koinonia, we have food. That's part of hospitality. Continue doing that. We, we are able to do this. Bless those who persecute you. Uh-oh. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. The last three lines in white, that's pretty okay. I can do that. But the one in yellow, the one on top, uh, that's kind of tricky. Bless those who persecute you. We cannot do this on our own. We need Jesus Christ. We need the good news to be able to do this. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. When someone is conceited, it's always me, 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 me. What's good for me? What's pleasing to me? Do not be like that. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Jesus did, did this so much. He modeled this for us. We just have to look back at his, at, at his own experience written in the Gospels. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. I like this part. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. <laughs> live at peace with everyone. 
ganda tingnan, di ba? It's so nice to look at it, so nice to say it, but it's so difficult to live this out. But good thing Paul says, as far as it depends on you. Because there's, there's, there's this misconception, I think, that when you say you have to live in peace, that you have to fix both sides of the party. But Paul here is reminding us, just do your part. Do what you can do. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do what you can. Do not force the other party to, to, to do something about it because that's their decision. We can influence them, we can encourage them, but we're not in the business of changing the other person. But we are in the business of changing ourselves through Jesus Christ. Uh, the next one is, again, another powerful command. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. When I see do not take revenge, I, I'm, I always remember these action movies when this main character, he or she will always have his family hurt or killed. You will pay for this. And then because of that event, we see, ah, it's justified. It's okay to take revenge. His family got hurt. His family got killed. His daughter got kidnapped. And therefore, all of his or her actions are justified that I can take revenge. Well, it's entertaining in a movie, but that's not what is called for us. Do not take revenge. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Does this mean that, ah, it's God's role to avenge? Does that mean that I can pray, Lord, the one who hurt me, can you, you know, shoot a lightning bolt at that person? No, no, no. It's not like that. It's not like that. Let God do or serve justice on his own terms, on his own terms. I, I, I like the next part. Instead of us seeking revenge, Paul gives an alternative. Do not take revenge, but instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Can you imagine that like Ricardo Dalisay or an action star, the main character of your movie, uh, his family died, uh, my son, my daughter, and then the enemy is right there. Here's food. Gutom ka ba? You want to eat? <laughs> it's unthinkable, right? But, but here, that's the command given to us Christians. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. That's pretty much what Jesus did. Jesus got crucified on the cross, yet he saved us. Paul is trying to explain here what Jesus did. Do that. Do that. This next part is quite interesting. Paul says here, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. What does that mean? So if I can imagine, this person hurt me. Oh, may uling ako. I have coals here. And put it on his head to, to burn the, the scalp or the hair. I, I don't know what it means, but it actually means something. Some scholars say that when you show so much kindness to someone that has hurt you, when you show so much generosity to someone who has persecuted you, that person on the other side will think, I was so mean, yet this person is still so kind. What is happening? What's going on? And then that burning coal, somehow he will feel that heat of shame inside him. Some Bible scholars say that that's the meaning of burning coals. I want to propose another one. Another meaning is, when I saw this word, this phrase burning coals, I remembered something similar happened in the Old Testament. When there was a prophet who was facing God and he felt that I am not worthy. I'm, so, I'm a sinner. I'm looking at God right now. I will die. I'm not worthy. You know who that prophet was? Isaiah. Isaiah. Here's the photo of Isaiah. There. He was facing God and there was a seraphim. A seraphim was this angelic figure with six wings. Imagine six wings. Two wings covering the face, two wings flapping, and then two wings covering the legs. Scary figure, I have to say. And one of the seraphims went to Isaiah and then place got a tongue like that, and then place that burning coal in his mouth. Isaiah was so afraid, I will die. I am a sinner, I cannot see God. But you know what the burning coal did? Instead of killing him, it purified him. 
coal is a symbol for purification. And I think that's what Paul is trying to say here. When you are so kind, when you are so loving, even to those who persecute you, somehow God is using you to purify that person. You have so much love that you give, it purifies and it transforms the other person. It's not you who's doing that. It's God himself who will be doing that. But you are a vessel. You are a vehicle of that loving kindness to that other person. Imagine that. It's tough to do, right? It's tough to do. When you have someone who hurts you so much, yet you're so kind to that person, just wait and see. God will perform a miracle one of these days. Paul ends that chapter like this, and this is such a powerful one. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I even teach this to my students, my fourth graders, they're nine, ten-year-olds. When someone teases them, I tell them, do not tease back. When someone bullies them, don't bully back. When someone hits you, don't hit back. You overcome that evil with good. When Paul said, love sincerely, that's what it means. That's what it means. Jesus' followers love genuinely. Jesus' followers love genuinely. If you know the gospel, if you know the good news so well, we're able to do that. We're able to do that. Let's review what N.T. Wright said in his book, Simply Good News. The good news is, Something happened, that's Jesus. God decided to literally go down with us and be with us so that we can be saved. Because of that, something's happening. We are changed. We are transformed. We can now love one another. We can love even those who persecute us. And something will happen. It's important that remember that we are doing this and we are waiting for the future when Jesus comes back again and we will be with him for eternity. And those enemies that you're thinking of, the people who have hurt you, justice will be served at the end. It's not us. We're not the judge. We're not the ones doing the judgment right there and then. Just believe that all the evil that we experience in the world, God is in control. We trust him. We trust him that he is in charge of what's happening. Here's a challenge for everyone. We love as Jesus loves. We love as Jesus loves. So think about this. I want this to be very concrete to every single one of us. What did Jesus do when he was here on earth? He dined with the outcasts with the tax collectors, with the prostitutes, people that are hated by the community. He reached out to them. That's his love. When people were trying to frame him, were trying to hurt him, spreading lies against him, he just kept on loving. He kept on loving. He kept on serving. When his disciples don't understand what he was saying, he just kept on being patient and just kept on repeating his words. When we here kept on sinning, he still died for us. That's what genuine love is. Jesus' followers love genuinely. You want to make relationships work? We have done, we have covered our relationship with God the past few weeks. The challenge for the next few weeks would be, can we also spread that love horizontally to our brothers and sisters? The title of our session this coming weekend for the next Koinonia is the, the friend that everyone longs for. We can be that friend that everyone longs for. However, here's the thing. We can't do it on our own because we're not perfect. But I would like to propose right now that we already have a friend that everyone longs for. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And if you don't have a relationship yet with Jesus, maybe this is now God calling you. I'm speaking to everyone here in this place and also online. We are being reminded now that 
it's so difficult to love those who hurt us if we don't have Jesus yet in our lives. I would even have to say it's impossible. It's impossible to love other people, especially those who are so difficult to love, if we don't have Jesus to change us first. So maybe God is calling you right now to change us, to save us from sin. Jesus' followers love genuinely. And when we know that, we can love as Jesus loves. Thank you.